Hi everyone and welcome back to our Bible study. Today we're talking about Psalm 56. I'm sorry that there's no video of me on these studies. I had a lot of audio studies recently and the reason for that is because my wife and I are waiting to get back into our apartment. The people who own it are having some travel problems and things so we're kind of in limbo while we're waiting on them. It's just kind of a mess and so uh, m our situation's been kind of volatile so audio is just a whole lot easier at the time being. So hopefully we'll be back to video soon. But let's talk now about Psalm 56. The author is David, and there are no New Testament references that I'm aware of to Psalm 56. We have three themes and three definitions. The first theme, oppression by those who proudly persecute God's people. We're going to read about that. Number two, God takes note of all the sorrows of his saints. And then number three, there's no reason to fear flesh and blood when God is on your side. Definitions, we've got some interesting ones today. Now, the first one comes from the introductory section of Psalm 56. It says that the psalm is according to the dove on a far-off terebinth. Uh, so, what this phrase signifies is somewhat unknown. Some scholars think it refers to the tune of the psalm, while other people see the dove as symbolic of David, who had to fly far away from his home to seek refuge from his from from King Saul who was trying to kill him and from his enemies so it, it, well the second word miktam I can't give you too much more information on that one either no one knows the precise meaning of the word miktam there are some theories out there but it seems like nothing concrete uh, maybe one day an archaeological find will will reveal the meaning to us but as you've noticed there are several of these very specialized terms a lot of times in the introductions of the Psalms that you know, we just haven't quite figured out exactly what they mean yet. And then the Philistines, we do know who those guys are. We read about them a lot in First and Second Samuel. This nation of Canaanites were the longtime enemies of the Israelites. They lived in the promised land because the people of Israel failed to drive them out when they conquered the land. They lived in the western portion of Judah's land down towards the south of the promised land near the Mediterranean Sea. We do have a little bit of context as we open Psalm 56 in the introduction section. This psalm was composed when David was on the run from King Saul. David fled to a city called Gath, which was a Philistine city, and he was captured by the Philistines there. You can read about that in 1 Samuel 21, 10 through the first verse of chapter 22. So our section heading today, surrounded by adversaries, but protected by God. 13 verses today. Once again, David was tormented by his enemies. And in this context, his enemies were King Saul and the Philistines. He said that his enemies were trampling him and they were proud of it, right? They were unashamed of treating him poorly and abusing him. They were waiting at every turn to ambush him. David wrote, quote, all day long, they injure my cause. All their thoughts were against me for evil. Now, David's in distress, but based on what we know about David's previous psalms, do you think he just ends this psalm in depression? No, this follows the, the very similar pattern that we've seen before. David was in distress, but he wasn't hopeless. He said, quote, In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? He knew that God was aware of his trouble when he spoke to God, saying, You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? And I think that's, I, I'm not sure there's any wording quite like that in the rest of the, the Bible, talking about God collecting our tears, taking account of our tears, collecting them in his bottle. And that's what I want to talk about for our application section. Did you know that God collects all your tears in a jar? Now, I don't think that's technically literal, right? But uh, the idea, the, the, the sentiment there is still true. Not even one of our tears falls to the ground without his noticing. He documents them in his book. And you just think about this, the same God who monitors the Andromeda galaxy, which is the closest galaxy to us, if you're going at the speed of light, it would take you 2.5 million years to get there. The same God that monitors that galaxy and all the others is so present and aware of his creation that silent tears from one of his 8 billion humans can't hit the ground without him taking note of it in his records. God's awareness of the near infinite elements of the universe is mind-boggling to us, or it should be. And so, you know, what can we take away from this? What, what can we think about in an application? When you pray to God, you can pray personal prayers. You don't have to pray in generalities, as if God only knows you generally, as if God only has time to send back general answer, answers. 
God knows every detail about you. He knows your emotions, your thoughts, your temptations, and every factor that has affected the way that you feel in any day and in any particular minute of your life. God is unimaginably great, but he's also remarkably personal. Those two things are a rare combination, at least in human beings. You know, he manages trillions of light years of universe, but he also notices the small things. You can't cry into your pillow without him being beside you and aware of it and him taking account of it, no doubt so that he can orchestrate the factors in your life to comfort you and care for you.